Chapter 4, A Common Master Plan I don't remember what we ate that first morning. I know we stood for half an hour in cutting wind waiting to get our food. Then we took it back to the cubicle and ate huddled around the stove. Inside it was warmer than when we left because Woody was already making good his promise to Mama, tacking up some ends of lathe he'd found, stuffing roller paper around the door frame. Trouble was, he had almost nothing to work with. Beyond this temporary weather stripping, there was little else he could do. Months went by, in fact, before our home changed much at all from what it was the day we moved in. Bare floors, blanket partitions, one bulb in each compartment dangling from a roof beam, and open ceilings overhead so that mischievous boys like Ray and Keo could climb up into the rafters and peek into anyone's life. The simple truth is the camp was no more ready for us when we got there than we were ready for it. We had only the dimmest ideas of what to expect. Most of the families like us had moved out from Southern California with as much luggage as each person could carry. Some old men left Los Angeles wearing Hawaiian shirts and Panama hats and stepped off the bus at an altitude of 4,000 feet with nothing available but sagebrush and tar paper to stop the April winds pouring down off the back of the Sierras. The War Department was in charge of all the camps at this point. They began to issue military surplus from the First World War. Olive drab knit caps, earmuffs, peacoats, canvas leggings. Later on, sewing machines were shipped in and one barracks was turned into a clothing factory. An old seamstress took a peacoat of mine, tore the lining out, opened the f and flattened the sleeves, added a collar, put armholes in, and handed me back a beautiful cape. By fall, dozens of seamstresses were working full-time transforming thousands of these old army clothes in into capes, slacks, and stylish coats. But until that factory got going and packages from friends outside began to fill out our wardrobes, warmth was more important than style. I couldn't help laughing at Mama, walking around in army earmuffs and a pair of wide-cuffed khaki-colored wool trousers, several sizes too big for her. Japanese were generally smaller than Caucasians, and almost all these clothes were oversized. They flopped, they dangled, they hung. It seems comical looking back. We were a band of Charlie Chaplins marooned in the California desert. But at the time, it was pure chaos. That's the only way to describe it. The evacuation had been so hurriedly planned, the camp so hastily thrown together, Nothing was completed when we got there, and almost nothing worked. I was sick continually with stomach cramps and diarrhea. At first, it was from the shots they gave us for typhoid, in very heavy doses in an assembly line fashion. Swab, jab, swab. Move along now. Swab, jab, swab. Keep it moving. That knocked all of us younger kids down at once with fevers and vomiting. Later, it was the food that made us sick, young and old alike. The kitchens were too bad, were too small and badly ventilated. Food would spoil from being left out too long. That summer, when the heat got fierce, it would spoil faster. The refrigerator, refrigeration kept breaking down. The cooks, in many cases, had never cooked before. Each block had to provide its own volunteers. Some were lucky and had a professional or two in their midst. But the first chef in our block had been a gardener all his life and suddenly found himself preparing three meals a day for 250 people. The man's in our runs became a condition of life, and you only hoped that when you rushed to the latrine, one would be in working order. That first morning, on our way to the chow line, Mama and I tried to use the woman's latrine in our block. The smell of it spoiled what little appetite we had. Outside, men were working in an open trench up to their knees in muck, a common sight in the months to come. Inside, the floor was covered with excrement, and all 12 bowls were erupting like rows of tiny volcanoes. Mama stopped a kimono-wrapped woman stepping past us with her sleeve, pushed up against her nose, and asked, What do you do? Try block 12, the woman said, grimacing. They have just finished repairing the pipes. It was about two city blocks away. We followed her over there and found a line of women waiting in the wind outside the latrine. We had no choice but to join the line and wait with them. Inside, it was like all the other latrines. Each block was built to the same design, just as each of the 10 camps from California to Arkansas was built to a common master plan. It was an open room over a concrete slab. The sink was a long metal trough against one wall with rows of spigots for hot and cold water. Down the center of the room, 12 toilet bowls were arranged in six pairs, back to back with no partitions. My mother was a very modest person, and this was going to be agony for her, sitting down in public among strangers. One old woman had already solved the problem for herself by dragging in a large cardboard carton. She set it up around one of the bowls like a three-sided screen. Oxidol was printed in large black letters down the front. I remember this well because it was the soap we were issued for laundry. Later on, the smell of it would permeate these rooms. 
the upended carton was about four feet high. The other woman behind it wasn't much taller. When she stood, only her head showed above the top. She was about Granny's age. With great effort, she was trying to fold the sides of the screen together. Mama happened to be at the head of the line now. As she approached the vacant bowl, she and the old woman bowed to each other from the waist. Mama then moved to help her with the carton, and the old woman said very graciously in Japanese, Would you like to use it? Happily, gratefully, Mama bowed again and said, Arigato. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. I will return it to your barracks. Oh, no, it is not necessary. Necessary. I'll be glad to wait. The old woman unfolded one side of the cardboard while Mama opened the other, and she bowed again and scurried out the door. Those big cartons were a common sight in the spring of 1942. Eventually, sturdier cart partitions appeared, one or two at a time. The first were built of scrap lumber. Word would get around that block such and such had partitions now, and Mama and my older sisters would walk halfway across the camp to use them. Even after every latrine in camp was screened, this quest for privacy continued. Many would wait until late at night. Ironically, because of this, midnight was often the most crowded time of all. Like so many of the women there, Mama never did get used to latrines. It was a humiliation she just learned to endure. Shikata gamai. This cannot be helped. She would quickly subordinate her own desires to those of the family or the community because she, she knew cooperation was the only way to survive. At the same time, she placed a high premium on personal privacy, respected it, and others insisted upon it for herself. Almost everyone at Manzanar had inherited this pair of traits from the generations before them who had learned to live in a small, crowded country like Japan. Because of the first, they were able to take a desolate stretch of wasteland and gradually make it livable. But the entire situation there, especially in the beginning, 